Hello and welcome to Walker and Dunlop's webinar on financing and commercial real estate market. I'm Susan Weber, your moderator for today. Before we get started, I have a few tips to enhance your webinar experience. Below the presentation view, you will see tabs you can use. We want to hear from you, so click Q&A to ask and submit your questions at any time during the presentation. Please note that this webinar is being recorded. I would like to welcome Willie Walker and his guest, Dr. Shri Kumar, who will discuss the global debt markets as well as the U.S. commercial real estate sector. Thank you for joining us, and now I will turn over the call to Willie. Thank you, Susan, uh, and good afternoon to those of you on the East Coast, and good morning to those in the mountain and western region. Uh, I am delighted to have um, Dr. Shri Kumar with us today uh, to give his perspectives on the global uh, economy and markets today. Uh, I'm going to turn the call over to him in a moment. Let me just um, start this off by first um, wishing everybody who's on this call right now um, good health, and um, I hope that um, this virus has not impacted you or your families. Um, we are all every day hearing of instances where people are being infected by it. Um, and um, at Walker and Dunlop, we've taken very proactive measures to make sure that um, people are not going to offices, um, that uh, we're all working in a remote uh, environment today. Uh, and I'm only assuming that many of you on the call today are in a similar situation uh, and dealing with both uh, connectivity between you and your colleagues, um, as well as trying to figure out how to proceed forward with business in this new environment. Um, I will, when I talk about commercial real estate funding and um, how we are proceeding forward, I will talk about those issues in specific. But I just wanted to start off saying, A, thank you for joining us. B, I'm very hopeful that the information that Shri and I um, uh, talk about today is helpful to everybody to try and navigate these very tricky markets. Um, they are moving exceedingly quickly. Uh, it feels like you talk about something, you look at where the market is yesterday afternoon and you wake up this morning and it is shifted on us. Um, there is no doubt that right now it feels very eerily like October and November of 2008, uh, which to those of us who were operating during that period of time, um, those were not happy times and uh, everyone was grasping for any type of stability or green shoots as it relates to when the great financial crisis was going to end. Um, and obviously we made it through that, um, but there was a lot of collateral damage during that period of time. And so um, let me turn the call over to Shri to give everyone his view on the global capital markets and interest rates. I, as my quick introduction to Shri, many of you uh, may have seen him on Squawk Box. He is a regular guest on Squawk Box. And what I found to be uh, most amusing when I went back to look at a number of his past times on Squawk Box was in December when Shri was on and, and, and Joe Kernan um, sat there at the beginning of the clip and goes, Shri, you're going to be wrong. You're going to be wrong. You're going to be wrong. Um, and the reason Joe said that is because for a very consistent and long period of time, Shri has been the voice of lower interest rates and our economy taking a step backwards. Uh, and as I listened to his taped interview back in December, I sat there and said, if everyone had listened to Shri, um, there would be a lot of us who would be in a lot better situation today uh, than many of us currently are. Uh, with that said, let me turn it over to you, Shri, to give your view of the world we're in, uh, GDP growth in Q2, Q3, and Q4, and where you think interest rates are headed. Thank you very much, Willie. And let me begin again by wishing you all good health, that you stay well through, during the coronavirus crisis. And on the economy, Willie, as you suggested, I just want to lay the groundwork for where we come from in terms of the economy, what happened in terms of the way we dealt with it before the coronavirus hit, and then go on to the impact of it and what is going on right now and what my expectations are for economic policy as well as for the economy and markets after the coronavirus passes. To begin with, uh, as you indicated earlier, I have long believed that the economy was not as good as the Trump administration made it out to be. The Trump tax cuts of late 2017 essentially caused two quarters of sugar high economic growth pickup 
and I did not believe that that would last. And sure enough, the growth has started, started to slow. And the reason is that in order to boost economic growth, you can't just do that by increasing the fiscal deficit, fiscal stimulus. What you need is really uh, education, training, young immigrants coming in to add to the manpower. Those are all the things that you need rather than something that is done through monetary or fiscal means. The Federal Reserve started initially to increase interest rates. Then Chairman Powell pivoted between December 2018 and January 2019 within a few days and started to indicate he was cutting rates and rather than raise rates, he cut rates three times. That was again not going to help the economy. The point I make here is that if you cut the interest rate 75 basis points, the person who was a plumber doesn't suddenly become a nuclear physicist. He or she is still a plumber. In order to change it, it takes a lot of effort, it takes education, and that kind of a structural adjustment was missing. So that is what led me to believe that we were not going to go on a high growth path. Second, on the inflation side, which is also very important to interest rates. My expectation was with the US economy and the population aging, and we not having enough of young immigrants coming in, the country was aging. We are currently the median age of Americans is about 37 or 38 years old, and that has been steadily rising with time. And that is not a positive development for the economy or for consumer spending either. And that is why my expectation was that the Fed was totally on the wrong path in terms of expecting inflationary expectations to rise. Put them both together, slower economic growth and inflation remaining very benign, and the combination of that you get is relatively low interest rates. And that is what led to the forecast. Everything else you can ignore, just look at these two factors. Then we come closer to where we are now, and there were lots of signs of negativity toward the end of last year. We had an inversion of the, trade, uh, of the yield curve. We also found that factory manufacturing orders started to weaken, and all of these developments led me to say, even before the coronavirus hit, that the U.S. economy would be in recession by mid-2020. What the coronavirus has done right now, uh, really, is that my expectation is that this will be deeper than before, that we are already going, we are already in a recession, and that we will find that out when the National Bureau of Economic Research, which is the arbiter of economic recessions, tells us so about a year from now. What does it mean in terms of being in a recession? I expect a GDP growth of at least 7% decline in the second quarter of 2020 compared with the first quarter. This is quarter to quarter change at an annualized rate. And then continuing on with another 3% decline in terms of the third quarter. If I'm, my forecast is wrong, the risk to my forecast is that I was not sufficiently pessimistic in the expectation. Could you have a minus 10% in the second quarter? Yes, it is possible depending on how severe the spread of the pandemic is and how well the economic measures are being taken. But that having been said, I look for the final quarter of the year to be relatively flat and 2021 to be a year of economic recovery. What does it mean overall on the real estate side? My expectation is that cap rates increase in the short term because if I were leasing property and if I were looking to either pay you uh, rent or pay my workers' wages, my uh, focus would be on paying my work, uh, wages first to the workers and making sure they continue to come to work. That's my basic belief. But with inflation still remaining at a high level for 2021, economic growth picking up, I think property values should be maintained. And so essentially you have a period of a dip in terms of uh, the things in real estate but then a pickup in 2021. Perhaps I should stop here, Willie, and turn it back to you. Great, Sri. Could you for a moment talk about the move in the 10-year, where we saw the 10-year two weeks ago dip below 50 basis points. Today, it's back over 100 basis points. 
Should we view that as a positive sign uh, as it relates to stability in the debt capital markets? Or is uh, it would appear to be counter to most people's thinking that the Fed would go and cut to the degree that they did on Sunday, and yet you've seen a sell-off in the tenure? That's a great question, Willie. A couple of weeks ago, and until then, we had the 10-year yield come down. And if I get my figures correctly, the low was about plus 32 basis points just intraday for a short while. The 10-year really went down very low. And that was the time with the panic. The risk assets were all discarded. People were trying to head for the exit as fast as they could and look for a safe haven and the treasury was the ultimate safe haven that they went to the risk-free security. What we have had since, and especially in the last 10 days, is that the panic has transformed and it's important to realize what has happened since. What started out as a flight from risk assets has now turned out to be a situation where with margin calls, people have to get more cash. And also at the same time, they are finding out that they want to hold cash you know, as a way of uh, having the ultimate risk-free asset even more so than the 10-year treasury. So what we have seen in recent days is a flight not only from equities, but from treasuries as well as people started to hold cash, which is what explains the fact that the treasury yield is now trading at over uh, 1%. If you look forward, and see what, it is, what is likely to happen, my expectation is that we will come back closer to normal within courts. That means, again, staying away from risk assets, but the panic in the money market, the panic in the commercial paper market will be relieved to quite an extent with the Federal Reserve support that comes on. However, the Federal Reserve and the government are not going to support the stock market so there is a flight from risk assets, but not from U.S. Treasuries, and therefore the U.S. Treasuries start to come down in yield. And my expectation is that it could go as low as 0%, even if for a very short period of time before it starts to rise again. So you, you do not believe that we get to a negative 10-year? Uh, I don't believe that we get to a negative 10-year because the U.S., characteristics are very different from that of Germany, which has had negative yield for a long time. The difference is that the population is larger. Uh, the US population, ha in fact, is younger than the European population. Therefore, the consumption expenditure spending is much greater. And immigration, despite the Trump policies to restrict it, is still in a better shape in the United States than in a good part of Europe. So my expectation is that Europe will avoid, uh, the, that the United States will avoid negative 10-year yields, uh, even though you have to see that going very close to the zero level. The scenario you just talked through as it relates to the payment system, repo lines, the high yield market, sounds very much like a 2008 scenario. Have the moves that the Fed and the Treasury Department taken over the last week in, in somewhat record fashion and in very, if you will, broad swaths, does it alleviate many of the funding issues that cropped up in 2008 as the previous administration tried to deal with what was, if you will, an unknown animal at that time where it took them time to get their arms around it, they had to bring all the big banks executives in. As you think about the funding of the banking system and the overall payment system in the United States, you're painting a picture that says that everyone's, if you will, right now in somewhat of a panic mode. Do you think that is unwarranted given the actions that the federal government has already taken on the uh, payment side of things and, the, and putting liquidity into the system? I think uh, we learned a lot from the 2008 crisis. 2008 had really large commercial and investment banks which were in trouble. There was a risk of bankruptcy at the highest levels of the US financial system. I believe that that does not happen, uh, that doesn't happen to be the case today. I think we have a situation where their earnings are at uh, risk for many of the large banks, but their balance sheet issues are in much better, healthier condition than they were 11 years ago, which is a, which is a good development. That having been said, your other question related to the Fed. 
The Fed did two things, one of which, in my opinion, was totally useless in terms of cutting interest rates, first by 50 basis points, and then last Sunday by another 100 basis points, lowering it practically to zero. That did not achieve anything during a situation of panic. Where the Fed is helpful and is, I think, still continuing to work effectively in suggesting that it will support the various commercial paper markets, it will provide short-term loans to financial institutions, to on-lend to their borrowers, and essentially will be there to provide emergency assistance. That is what Chairman Powell and his colleagues should have done in the first uh, part, rather than go through the phase of cutting interest rates. So we essentially wasted a couple of bullets but now we are on the right track in terms of the support the Fed is suggesting. Terrific. Um, I'm going to um, jump in behind you there, Sri, and now take the conversation from, if you will, 30,000 feet down to 10,000 feet to talk about commercial real estate for a moment. And then um, we will start to take questions in about 10 or 15 minutes. Um, I see a number that have come into the queue that we will both start to address. Let me give a, a quick update. Uh, as it relates to the overall commercial real estate markets and what we are seeing today. Um, the first thing is, um, if you look at the four major food groups as asset classes, um, as is probably no surprise to those on the line, given the role that Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and HUD play in the multifamily industry, um, there is still plenty of liquidity in the multifamily space, and um, there is a high volume of deals being processed both from a lending standpoint as well as from an investment sales standpoint. I'll talk about investment sales and the, and the M&A markets in a moment. But as it relates to uh, lending activity, multifamily, while spreads have blown out a little bit, and I'll give you specific information on that, multifamily is still uh, extremely active, um, plenty of investor demand for Fannie and Freddie and HUD paper. And that market continues forward essentially unabated today. If you look at office, that's probably, excuse me, if you look at industrial, industrial is without a doubt in the second best position to multifamily right now. Um, across the country, we are still getting lenders quoting on industrial deals. And given where this economy seems to be going, and if you will, in a distributed economy, the need for Amazon depots and industrial to continue to go, uh, industrial is still getting bids in, and plenty of life insurance companies um, and banks are uh, quoting deals on industrial. Uh, the next down would be office. Office is starting to get scarce as it relates to bids on deals. Um, very little activity as we can all imagine in the office leasing space um, and nobody right now is touring new properties to figure out where they're going to move their headquarters in six months. And so the office market, while ha they have long-term leases in place, which gives cash flow to that asset class much better than some others. Um, the number of lenders willing to quote on office has fallen quite dramatically, but it is still there. Um, the next is retail. Um, as everyone can imagine, retail has been under pressure for the last couple years. Um, getting anyone to quote on a retail property right now is extremely challenging. And then the final one where there has truly been a complete flight of capital is in hospitality. Um, hospitality is under massive pressure right now. Um, that's no surprise to anybody. And as a result of that, on two weeks ago, we had um, some hospitality deals we were quoting. Um, we actually had bids on them, low leverage deals, 60, 65% LTV. Um, rates were coming in at a, at a coupon rate of around 350. Um, that is now a thing of the past. Um, there, is, there is nobody right now quoting on a hospitality deal. And it would be my expectation that we see um, defaults coming in in the hospitality space um, as uh, debt service starts to take over there. Um, let me switch for a moment to uh, spreads on multifamily and then what we're also seeing in the CMBS market. Um, CMBS, AAA CMBS swaps plus 190 to 200 is what we're getting today. Um, if you look at that same indicator uh, in mid-February, um, that was swaps plus 85 to 90. So that's widened out by 110, 120 basis points in the last month um, on CMBS AAAs. On dust TBAs, so Fannie Mae dust bonds, um, those are pricing today at swaps plus 110 to 115. 
Um, if you backed up to mid-February, uh, that was trading at swaps plus 80 to 85. So you have clearly seen some widening there, but nothing close to what you've seen on the CMBS side. The Freddie K that was priced yesterday was actually oversubscribed. Um, it priced at swaps plus 90. So it's actually trading right now inside of where dust bonds are trading. Um, the expectation is the offering they bring out next week will widen. Obviously, we have no idea where the market's going to go, but the projection would be that it was going to widen to 95 or 100 over. Um, and so um, both Fannie and Freddie at that swaps plus 95 to 110 um, are getting a lot of investor demand for their paper. One of the interesting things that we have seen happen is because you've seen so much refinancing activity in the single family side, a lot of RMBS investors have, if you will, rotated over from RMBS into CMBS because they're looking for call protection on their investments right now. Um, and so a number of those uh, investors who used to be buying single family paper are now coming over to multifamily paper. I would also add that many of you saw the Fed on Sunday announce their bond buying program. Um, they went into the market on Monday and Tuesday and started buying single family MBS on the short end of the curve. Um, that tightened that part of the market dramatically on Monday and Tuesday. Um, that didn't have a big impact on the longer end of the curve as well as in CMBS bonds. But as you're getting support and liquidity at the short end of the curve on MBS, it's bound to help the longer end of the curve with CMBS. Um, if you look at overall um, gross borrowing rates that we're looking at from a borrower standpoint, spreads and base rates and treasury floors um, are being established almost on a daily basis. So spreads are bouncing around. One day you've got a, a, a treasury floor, the next day the treasury floor has been moved. Um, generally speaking, coupon rates that we've been seeing over the past couple of weeks have been between three and 350, um, all in borrowing rate to borrowers. Some of our borrowers have been lucky enough to have had a deal that was priced prior to the crisis, got a falling 10 year that had already been rate locked on a spread lock and that they printed a 250 or 275 deal. But just for people's general thinking, if you're getting a deal done today with the agencies or HUD, you're probably looking at an all-in coupon rate somewhere between 3 and 325. Um, the other thing that I would put forth is Freddie Mac came out day before yesterday stating that they had had $25 billion of deal flow in the last three weeks. To give you a reference point on that, Fannie and Freddie um, on, a, on a monthly basis have typically in a, in, a, in a high volume month done around eight or nine billion of deal flow. So the fact that Freddie got 25 billion in the last three weeks is completely off the charts of anything we've seen previously. Um, it is great that business is still being processed and that we are still funding loans. Um, I would put forth two thoughts. One is that it is my assumption, but I have not heard anything explicit that the FHFA We'll look at Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac's lending caps in multifamily and we'll make adjustments so that they can exceed their caps for 2020. I have not heard anything along those lines, given that this has only just begun and they are both nowhere near their caps at this point. It might be somewhat premature to have discussions on that, but I think anything that FHFA does to give the market an understanding that they will allow Fannie and Freddie to expand beyond they both have about $80 billion of lending capacity for 2020 um, would be a great message to the market. And given all of the other things that the Trump administration has been doing as it relates to both maintaining and increasing liquidity, I would think they go and do that. Um, the second thing is I have been honestly stunned by clients who have um, tried to better deals at this time in the market who have gone and, and tried to ask for more. We had a very large deal last week um, where they came back, asked us to tighten by 10 basis points when uh, the agencies were widening by 20 um, and the deal went another way. Um, and to be honest with you, I, I turned to my deal team and I said, um, pigs get fat, hogs get slaughtered. This was a client who was acting like a hog at that time. We'll see how it all plays out for them. My point being is, um, our team and other lenders across the country are working exceedingly hard to process transactions today. If you have a deal in hand, my strong recommendation would be take it. Um, if you look at um, life companies right now, as I mentioned in other asset classes, many of them are having a hard time actually bidding. Where they are bidding, many of them have had difficulty getting below a 3% all-in coupon rate to the borrower. 
Um, we're seeing bidding at 325 to 350 um, in those life insurance companies that still have capital and are still operating. On the CMBS side, we have heard various lenders stepping out of the market. The word that I got this morning was that B of A is no longer quoting CMBS. Um, my understanding is that they have a lot um, that they have taken out down that they have not securitized and therefore they're not looking at new business. Um, there are also specialty finance companies out there um, that are dealing with the headwinds of the inability to raise new capital uh, and also having exposure to things like condominiums and retail. And so if you look at some of the specialty finance um, mortgage REITs, many of them have sold off dramatically. I would assume for a period of time, many of them are not going to start initiating new loans and are holding on um, to see where this um, takes us. Let me talk for a moment as it relates to um, processing of loans. Um, I've gotten a number of questions as it relates to if a deal is under app, is it going to move forward? The direct answer to that is yes. Um, we are running into a couple issues right now as it relates to processing business. Um, the first one is inspections. Um, as many of you know, this virus has gone into student, excuse me, seniors housing properties, uh, particularly in the state of Washington, and put many seniors housing properties on lockdown. Pretty hard to go and do an inspection of a property that they don't allow uh, engineers and inspectors to go and take a look at. We are trying to do workarounds, particularly in seniors housing, although I would tell you getting seniors housing quotes today is a very, very difficult thing. Um, if you go out and look at some of the publicly traded stocks in the seniors housing space, Ventas, uh, Brookdale, uh, New Seniors, they have all truly been taken to the woodshed. And I think it is a wait and see on how that sector uh, makes it through this very uh, difficult time. Um, but as it relates to standard multifamily, we are also getting tenants who are saying, I don't want someone coming in and looking at my unit. Um, we're working very hard to figure out what units we can go see. We're trying to work with owners as well as property managers to potentially have tenants take pictures of the units and then verify that they actually occupy the unit. Um, but in this sort of shelter in place environment, as all of us can be appreciative of, tenants don't really want a stranger walking through their uh, unit to make sure that the unit is actually occupied by them and that structurally it is in good play, in good standing. The other place that we're running into some problems is in recordation. Uh, many, many municipal offices across the country have shut down. Um, I saw a statistic two days ago that 88% of the counties in America can do e-filing um, for uh, title, and that would allow us to then put title insurance in place on mortgages. Um, but there are some very large counties. Uh, the most recent one that I saw yesterday was Montgomery County, Maryland, and Prince George's County, Maryland. Both do not have the capability to do e-filing. So if we have loans or sales that are going on in those counties, being able to record those events and being able to get title insurance issued is going to be problematic. So we are working very diligently to both figure out workarounds and then also talk to uh, county and state governments to make sure that at a time when liquidity in the mortgage markets is desperately needed, that this, um, if you will, shutdown uh, does not allow us to not continue to extend credit and does not allow us to continue to operate. Um, I want to quickly turn before I get to questions, and we're right on schedule as it relates to about 15 minutes with Shri and 15 with me, and then we'll go to, I've got a queue of about 32 questions in here that we'll start taking a look at. Um, but um, I did want to say that as it relates to overall operations, as it relates to overall health, um, we had this morning one of our uh, banking partners call us and say that they'd been with two Walker and Dunlop employees at the beginning of March. At, a, at, a, at an event and that, that their employee had, um, uh, had tested positive for the coronavirus yesterday and they were informing us that our employees had been with them. Um, we went to remote officially across the Walker and Dunlop platform last Thursday, uh, but prior to that many of us had been working remotely and fortunately both of the Walker and Dunlop individuals had been working remotely for the past two weeks. The reason I raise that is because immediately that call comes in and we know we don't have an issue inside of Walker and Dunlop as far as either of those individuals having infected other people from that incident with uh, someone from a bank that we work with very consistently. Super, super helpful that we were not coming together for the past couple of weeks and that is how this virus is going to slow down. That's how it's going to make it that that incident didn't have a multiplier effect. Um, I, I listened to a webcast two days ago talking about the multiplier effect of the coronavirus. 
the estimates right now are 2.4 to 4x. So every person who is being in, infected right now, the estimates are that they are infecting 2.4 to four other people. Um, anything we can do to separate from one another and make sure that this virus is not being passed um, is going to slow this down and allow us to get to on the other side of it. Um, the other thing that I would talk about is there's been a lot of talk about the need for more hospital beds. There are 45,000 emergency care hospital beds in the United States today. Um, I have been talking uh, to HUD, uh, which has been talking to the White House about potentially repurposing student housing beds, um, which today, off-campus student housing beds, um, which today in some instances are vacant, in other instances students are still occupying those beds in cities. Um, but the idea would be, can you go and master lease some student housing properties um, and create makeshift hospital beds uh, to be able to deal with what is expected to be a complete inundation of our hospitals across the country with people who are suffering from this virus. Um, I know HUD and the White House are working hard on that. If any of you own student housing properties and would like to talk uh, with the federal government about potentially doing a master lease on those properties, um, send me an email, uh, be in touch, and we'll, we'll coordinate uh, whether they're actually going to move forward with doing anything along those lines. Um, but. Uh, the, the back of the envelope numbers on that is if they took over 50 student housing properties across the country that had 300 beds in each one of them uh, for $180 million, I used the back of the envelope, 1000 bucks a bed for the year. Um, for $180 million, the federal government could add 15,000 beds of capacity um, on top of the 45,000 ICU beds um, and could create capacity to be able to take this, what is expected to be a huge influx of patients. Um, let me um, go to some questions um, that I've been getting in um, and uh, try and uh, um, uh, what I'd like to do first as I sort through them is just turn back over to Shri for any comments that he has as it relates to the overall markets or anything that has come to your thought as I talked about where the commercial real estate markets are or what we're seeing. Shri. Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, do you have a question for me or I'll... Yeah, so, um, so with a big infusion of cash into the economy and slowing economic output, what are your thoughts about stagflation? Uh, I don't believe stagflation is going to happen. Again, for the benefit of everybody connected here, stagflation refers to the economic phenomenon that we last saw in a significant manner between 1973 and 1975, when we had a severe recession during the Nixon-Ford administrations. And at the same time, inflation picked up because oil prices tripled in the fall of 1973, and we were ill-equipped to deal with the substitute for oil, and there was nothing at that time. Uh, the difference today is that we are in a very different situation. Uh, oil, first of all, is not as important as it was in the 1970s. There are other substitutes. And also, if, we, if the recession is being accompanied by a slower price change and older world population, and so stagflation seems to be much less of a likely thing rather than inflation remaining at a relatively low level. So, um, Shri, another question that came in was, you mentioned previously as it relates to cap rates um, expanding out and then coming back down due to inflation. Um, what's your sense as it relates to cap rates? Do you have a specific um, widening that you expect cap rates to move? And I understand that that question is a little difficult, A, because you're, you're not per se a real estate investor, and B, it really does vary dramatically across asset classes. But do you have any thoughts as it relates to cap rate widening? Uh, the cap rate widening, uh, you're absolutely right. It varies based not only on the asset class of, within real estate, but also on regions. Some regions are going to see cap rates increase significantly compared with before. So if you are pick a number, if you are picking a cap rate of, say, four, then if you assume that as the base, then with the rents not being paid or reduced rents being paid, I can see that going to a figure let's say six, and then it comes back to four again at the beginning of 2021. So I'm essentially giving an average of an average 
because we are talking about different asset classes and different regions. So it is a significant pickup in the cap rate, but it lasts for two or three quarters. Great. Um, I'm going to switch to a question from uh, my friend Brooks Castellaw, who came in and asked about the uncertainty in schools and college students and what happens in the fall if they're not going back to school. Um, that is a, a great question and obviously something that everybody in the student housing space is very focused on. Um, I would put forth that as of right now, pre-leasing activity from those student housing operators that I've spoken with has been very strong. So when I went out to a number of them over the weekend with this idea of converting student off-campus student housing into potentially makeshift um, hospital beds, um, I was expecting a number of them to say, count me in, sign me up, love to have a conversation about that. To the contrary, I got, A, we still have students who are occupying our buildings, and B, our pre-leasing for the fall is still very good. Um, obviously, the big unknown is how long this crisis lasts and whether um, uh, university systems come back to school in the fall. I think the outlook right now is everyone is saying that we will be on the other side of this and that school systems will be back up and running in September. The problem obviously for student housing owner operators is that it's a binary event. Um, one of the data points that I was very interested with um, prior to this call was I went out to a number of people on our team who finance seniors housing and I was expecting to hear that we've seen significant numbers of people pulling their seniors out of seniors housing. And to my A, surprise, and B, um, uh, I guess, um, to my surprise, was that we have not seen that happening so far. Um, there have been plenty of people who've talked about it. The interesting thing on seniors housing is if you think about acuity level, if your parents are an independent living facility, pulling them out and bringing them home uh, is, if you will, relatively easy, A, if you have space, B, if you live near them, because they're obviously not getting on an airplane, uh, and C, if you're up for having your parents live with you for an indefinite period of time. If you go to the other end of the spectrum on skilled nursing and Alzheimer's care, none of us are prepared to deal with a parent who is um, in a skilled nursing facility or has Alzheimer's care. And so as a result of that, those people, to a great degree, are very, very unlikely to come home. And so back to my comment previously, as far as firms like Ventas and New Seniors and others, on those that have the higher acuity, you would think that the people would stay there. Now, the mortality rate in those facilities is a whole different story and what ends up happening to those facilities when and if the virus gets into them. But as it relates to the virus not getting to them and having their rent rolls fall off precipitously, I would think at this point, you're, it's unlikely to see that happen. Um, but on the student side of things, it is obviously everybody's clear hope that we're back up and running come September and that universities are back up and going. But again, unlike multifamily, unlike seniors, it is a binary event as it relates to a school system operating or not operating. The other question that's come in across a lot of this is as it relates to either forbearance, people who can't pay their rents, what's the federal government going to do if people can't pay rent and owners can't evict people because like in New York State, they have um, started to come in saying you cannot evict people. Um, I would just say it is, it, it is too early to understand exactly where public policy is going to go to match up with the economic reality of people paying rents. I got a number of questions as it relates to how's our loan portfolio and how's it performing. Um, fortunately, it is performing exceptionally well, but we're also very, very early in all of this. Um, one of the things I would put forth is the great financial crisis lasted for 42 months, 42 months, and multifamily held up extremely well during that crisis, had by far the lowest default rates of any commercial real estate asset class. Um, and we are now into week three of this crisis. Now, there are clearly differentiators between the two. The entire economy appears to be grinding down, whereas in the great financial crisis, the economy didn't completely wind down. Waiters and waitresses were still making tips. Flight attendants were still getting on airplanes, even though at a less frequent basis than they are today. And so this go to zero as it relates to this crisis clearly presents a wildly different economic reality for many people. Um, I have stated before, as many of you know, 40% of the American public, if faced with a $400 or more unplanned event, cannot pay for it. 
40%. So if all of a sudden the waiter or waitress who is making a couple hundred dollars in tips on a monthly basis now loses that income, he or she is incapable of dealing with unexpected expenses. So we are dealing in somewhat uncharted territory here, but as it relates to overall rent, ro rent, rent rolls and asset by asset performance, um, so far, at least from Walker and Dunlop's perspective, things continue to operate very well. I would also put forth, we have no risk in our loan portfolio on any retail asset, any office asset, any industrial asset, or any hospitality asset, not a dollar. So all of our risk is in multifamily. Um, and so we are, as a company, somewhat distinct from many banks and many of our competitor firms that have broad risk on a broad sample of commercial real estate asset classes. Shri, um, have you seen um, anything in here as it relates to questions that you want to jump on or do you want me to uh, come up with another one um, for you? Yeah, if you could, that would be great because that way we'll know which of, which of the priority questions that we should handle uh, two or three at a time if you wish. Great. Um, so um, let, me, uh, let me come in here for a moment. Um, so... Um, so what will be the signal to mark it's of a return to stability? Will it be the decline in the number of coronavirus spread, or do you think society will decide that the economic cost is too heavy a burden to bear and insist on a more normalization of society regardless of the human cost? I think in terms of a full normalcy coming, I think it happens in two stages, really. The first stage, you want to see the coronavirus situation, which is currently accelerating, and again, following the example set previously by China and Italy, which are the two countries which preceded the United States in having the crisis, it continues to, to increase at an increasing rate for about six weeks. So as you said, we are in week two, and we probably have another four weeks to go with a larger and larger number of coronavirus crisis. Dr. Anthony Fauci, the medical advisor, said on different programs that that's about the time that he sees the virus continuing as well. So the first thing that investors need to watch is to see when it crests and starts to come down, which is what the experts call flattening the curve and it starts to increase, but at a slower and slower rate. That, I think, will go on till about July or August that the president spoke about in his press conference yesterday. During that time, so August being already going into the third quarter, we would see the extent of economic decline, how much of stock market uh, havoc has been caused during that time. Then you go into the fourth quarter, you have few cases of coronavirus crisis, and you see signs in terms of economic leading indicators, in terms of manufacturing activity, people going back to work, people going back to restaurants in, uh, more eagerly, and that would suggest to you a bottom. So if you follow that, the coronavirus is stage one, and economic indicators as the second one, I think you will see the, all of them come together closer to year end. Great. Um, I, a couple other questions that I have coming in here. So there is a huge amount here as it relates to forbearance and evictions and being able to um, have people pay their rent, et cetera, et cetera. As I, as I said previously, there is no federal policy that has been established on that to date. Um, as you can imagine, because Walker and Dunlop has a pretty large voice in these issues, um, we are talking to both MBA, NMHC, as well as directly with members of Congress, uh, as well as regulators, to make sure that if um, we do need relief along those lines that it's being considered. Um, I, I do know that both MBA and NMHC uh, were in um, earlier this week um, on uh, relief to renters, um, particularly if we get into a non-eviction st uh, status as um, California is putting into place. Um, I've also had a question as it relates to where's capital coming from and is anybody still bidding on assets? So um, I put the bidding world into kind of three buckets. Bucket one is friends and family and country club capital that um, many Walker and Dunlop clients 
um, have very successfully raised equity capital over many, many years to take down deals. Um, for all practical purposes, as high net worth individuals see their portfolios decreasing by 40 and 50% in value, um, capital is dried up there. The million dollar check went to $500,000 last week and I think it's probably gone to zero today. Um, and so that group of investors is on the sidelines today just from a capital raising standpoint. I'm quite certain that there will be somebody on this call who has plenty of friends and family capital that has said now's the buying opportunity and we're game in, but generally speaking, they are game off. Um, the second is the big institutions, the PE firms, um, who are sitting on huge amounts of capital. Uh, what we saw in the investment sales space last week um, was many of them falling away in the bidding process on larger assets. Um, they were in best and final, they were looking at it, and they then said, I'm out. Um, I would put forth that I think those investors who have plenty of capital are just gonna sit back for a moment, see how cap rates widen, um, see what sellers are capitulating to, and then they will step back in and they will be quite aggressive at the appropriate time. But right now, I believe that they are all mostly in a wait and see mode. They're not jumping in at this point. The final bucket is the opportunity funds. And the opportunity funds have been sitting around for, in some instances, four or five years on capital that is waited for the opportunity to step in and take advantage of dislocation in the market. And what we are seeing is those opportunity funds that have been waiting for this day are getting very active. They're underwriting deals to the degree that they can, and they're trying to figure out if there are already bargains for them to invest in. And so um, that may be an oversimplification of the three buckets of equity capital that are looking at deals, but from what we've seen on the investment sales side, that's a broad generalization about how those three sources of capital are um, behaving today. Um, I got a couple notes here as it relates to construction loans and construction properties um, being completed and then also getting municipalities um, to give C of O's. Um, clearly, getting people to come out to a property and give you a C of O is a little challenging when nobody at the uh, county office is actually working. Um, I have not heard of a specific issue there where a property delivered last week and can't get someone from a county to come out and give them a C of O, um, but invariably that is going to be an issue and those people who do have construction uh, pro properties under construction today um, need to get on the front foot there. Um, as I said, we are reaching out. We have a whole database today as it relates to which counties are open uh, for e-filing and which counties are closed. We have not done it as it relates to C of O's and going out and inspecting properties. Uh, but if we can be of any help there as it relates to our database, uh, please reach out to us. Um, I do know that several construction projects are still moving forward. Um, one of our clients who I, um, I, I will not mention here because I don't know whether they feel good or bad about having construction crews coming, but as I came into the office today to do this call, um, I did notice that the construction crew building a multifamily property here in downtown Denver um, was all at work today. I don't know how long construction crews will be able to continue to show up at sites and work with one another to continue forward on construction or whether all of that comes to a grinding halt, but for now, um, I would assume that they are practicing um, social distancing and they feel good that their construction workers with gloves on are not putting one another at risk. Um, uh, Willie, I saw a question come up from a top-down viewpoint on what regions within the United States would be most affected. And if I can take that question, I'm going to answer that in two parts. First is, which area seems to have the largest incidence and second, which states or regions are economically most important? Obviously, the more advanced states where it happens is going to have more of an economic impact on that state or that city as well as the country as a whole. And the second is where more of the infected individuals happen to be. In terms of the economic impact, there seems to be a number of cases developing in New York City and New York State, and I would point to that as one area where I think both the governor and the mayor of New York City seem to be working in unison in terms of trying to control it. The question is, do you have a total shutdown of New York City or not? And what impact would that have on the overall economy? So there I would make up and go one extra point in answering that question. The steps that need to be taken to bring the coronavirus incidents to a quick halt 
is going to go counter to the economic impact. So if you tell everybody to stay at home and not go anywhere, as Italy has done, for instance, it will have a very sharp economic impact if you do that, and which is why I think the president and his team delayed doing that for some time. On the other hand, if you don't do it on time, the incident spreads and essentially things will worsen. And that is what we know, for example, from what we learned from the Spanish flu of 1918. The second one in terms of regions affected, not as important economically as New York State, but Washington State has a significant amount of incidents. And that in turn suggests to me that there is going to be more of an acceleration there before it crests and the flattening of the curve starts to take place. Those would be my two states to focus on in terms of where the incidences are greatest. So Shri, if you could take that and move to oil. Um, oil is now below 30 bucks a barrel. It's hammering the Houston economy. Um, what's your thought as it relates to oil rebounding? How long does it stay down below 30 bucks a barrel? And what impact is that going to have if this thing carries on for much longer? Uh, it's a timely question, really. There are three factors you have to take into account in looking at oil prices. One, on the supply side, there, are, uh, there is the impact of uh, the fight between Saudi Arabia and Russia, both of which uh, want to control the oil market. Uh, Russia has fewer reserves than Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia wants the reserves to last a lot longer time. But the Russians have essentially separated from the output agreement, and that is causing a glut in the overall market. How much is the glut? Previous to that, it used to be one or two million barrels a day. I estimate that the glut is going to grow within the next month to about seven million barrels a day. When you're talking about total oil production of about 100 million barrels, seven million of excess supply is going to be quite substantial. So that is going to have a negative impact on uh, the oil market. Second factor. The coronavirus has already put a dampener in terms of uh, economic growth, whether it comes from oil, airlines demanding oil or whether it comes from less travel on the road. All of that is going to cause less fuel demand, and that is also going to put downward pressure taking place. The last one, and this is from the demand side, which has existed for quite a while, is that the global economy has been slowing down from 2018 to 2019 and remarkably sl uh, slowing down in 2020, even before the coronavirus hit. That was the reason why the glut was developing. And that's why there was a fight among the oil producers to produce more. So when you put all of them together, excess production by the producers, the coronavirus impact, and the world economy slowing down and therefore less oil demand put all together. And what is the answer I get? Another six to eight months of this oil market continuing to stay under pressure. Today, we went uh, significantly below $30. And I think we'll probably see $20 on Brent crude, which is quite a bit more of downside before there is stability takes place at year end. So, Shri, we only have another seven minutes, and I, I want to – I've got lots of questions still in the queue, um, and, and we will um, try and address a couple of them in the last couple of minutes. But I also want to, to some degree, to the degree that we can, talk about, okay, the world is not ending. We are going to make it through this. Um, there is going to be pain between here and there. If people are looking for opportunities today as it relates to if they happen to have money to put to work, um, uh, obviously, from your role as chief economist at the Trust Company of the West, you were constantly working with your team to reallocate capital to when, when, when one part of the, sec of the economy was doing badly, you would reallocate to another. Where are there opportunities today for investors to put money to work? Um, I would repeat to you um, the, the asset allocation on a general basis, really, and then go on um, to some particular asset classes. Overall, I think risk assets are going to be under pressure. That is, equities will be under pressure. High yield bonds will be under pressure. There will be a lot of distressed assets, both in real estate and non-real estate, taking place. 
energy related efforts are going to be under severe downward pressure all of these are on the negative side where should you put your money i look uh, again for a further rally in risk free assets whether it be german bonds or us treasuries more of it developing uh, more defensive people going into gold and also on the defensive side uh, what we call risk off equities utilities for instance to the extent they are giving you uh, a cash income and you're not looking for capital appreciation that, that would be an area to go in also interestingly i look for a double bar bell in terms of asset allocation which means that while you while i have a lot of money that i suggest on the uh, low side of risk as i mentioned on the higher side or illiquid portions if you select a good real estate and if you have a good manager and you're going to sleep tight for the next 5 to 7 years you're going to see all of those assets providing a good uh, internal rate of return over the next 5 to 7 years but you're going to have illiquidity and a portion of your assets should be there as well so if you look at uh, again the middle portion of the risk spectrum you're going to underemphasize and be more on the low side and the high side of of the risk spectrum so uh, there are a number of questions in here as it relates to um therapeutic drugs and um coming up with a vaccine against this virus um some of you may have watched uh Kramer last night he had a long interview uh with the CEO of a drug manufacturer that is extremely optimistic as it relates to the development of therapeutics by early summer um if um i have been listening to dr peter atia a t t i a um who has a podcast called the drive um atia has been from my view point exceptional at both getting guests on who are extremely insightful to development of therapeutic medicines as well as um uh, antiviral medication um and also a a a a real understanding of how the medical system can or can't deal with this virus and the incident level ramping up um uh, i would also uh, put forth that um if we can i mean unlike the great financial crisis i remember distinctly in 2008 i was with my friend kevin warsh who at the time was a governor of the federal reserve and kevin and i um got together for a for a, a quick hello at the end of a very long day for kevin and i asked him can you see light at the end of the tunnel and this was november of 2008 and he said wills right now all i see is darkness he had absolutely no ability to see an end to the financial crisis as the federal reserve and treasury and our federal government was throwing everything they could at this crisis and as some of you who have heard kevin speak at walker and dollar events before kevin talked about going to to chairman bernanke and saying to him i'm going to come to you with an idea day and we're going to put something in place every single day and we're just going to throw stuff against the wall and at some point something's going to stick. They were that desperate to come up with something to stop the market spinning down. On this one we know there's light at the other end of this. We've looked at China, we've looked at South Korea. We know that countries have dealt with this and moved beyond it. China 2 days ago closed their last hospital that they had built. They built 12 hospitals to deal with the influx of patients. They closed their last makeshift hospital 2 days ago because they don't have need for more beds. Um South Korea has dealt with this issue extremely well, but they had testing kits across the country immediately and have done multiples of the number of tests the United States has. As some of you know, testing kits are going to be at the millions of units available in the United States next week. Unfortunately, they weren't here 2 or 3 weeks ago. but testing is going to slow this curve down dramatically because we are going to be able to see who has it who doesn't and we are going to be able to separate people quickly that in and of itself just knowing who has it and who doesn't i think brings this from defcon 5 down to potentially defcon 3 or defcon 2 in the sense that this panic that seems to be running through the markets right now is all about we don't know how fast this is going to grow we don't know what the infection rate is and we don't know who has it And so once we get that under control I would put forth that some of the sort of Armageddon scenarios that many people are thinking about now you have to think about them. 
liquidity is going to be king over the next couple of weeks. It's just going to be king. I spoke to the chief operating officer at one of the big five banks this morning. He said, everything is great, but we have got real damage in our consumer sector and we've got real damage in our small business sector. And they are doing everything from forbearance to working with their clients to make sure that there is still liquidity. But they are going to deal with significant defaults and significant bankruptcies in their general lending business, no doubt. But at the same time, I also talked to him about a very significant deal that Walker and Dunlop is working on now that is going to need significant capital from a warehouse line. And he in no way blinked and said, we won't be able to, we won't be, able to be there for you. He said, great, we'll be there for you. We've got plenty of capital to do that deal. Now, that's on a warehouse line that's going to take down a Fannie Mae piece of paper that has a government guarantee behind it, and they're not going to lose any money on it. It's very different from me saying to him, please give Walker and Dunlop a new revolver today. But with that said, back up to 2008, that same bank shut off all of their warehouse lending to every Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac lender other than Walker and Dunlop. So to give you a sense of where we were back then to where we are today as it relates to the core financial system, we are in much better shape today for today than we were back then. And we clearly know what the other side of this looks like. I'd go back to my comment that the great financial crisis lasted for over 40 months. Most people are right now are talking about several months for us to get into the summer months and have the incidence level start to go down the other side. So I see that we are out of time. It's 1131. I've got about 58 questions in the queue that we didn't get to. To all of you who joined us and who didn't get your question asked, um, answered, um, please feel free to ping me an email. And if it's for Sri, I will send it along to him. And if he has the time and the interest in responding to it, he will do so. Um, I would just say to all of you who joined us today, many thanks for taking the time. We greatly appreciate the partnership. I hope this was a helpful session. And um, if we can be of help in any way, please reach out. At these times where things are moving so quickly, communication is obviously exceedingly important. So thanks for taking the time. Shri, again, thank you very much for joining us today. A huge thank you all. Very insightful. And I wish everyone a happy and healthy day.